Okay, so there's a couple of things I want to talk about today. So firstly, what's out there right now? What kind of secondary analysis can we do with our reads? And crucially, what sort of software should we be using to do that? Then we'll have a look at some of the latest developments we've had in this area. And specifically, I'll talk about the variant cooling performance of our new V5 models and also our TTT human assembly protocol. In the final part of the talk, we'll have a look to the future. We've been having a lot of success with some new neural network architectures for consensus polishing. And so I'm really excited to share those with you. Before I do that, though, I should define what I mean by this term, secondary analysis. And when we do sequencing, we usually have a process that looks something like this. So we get raw signals from the device. You can see them here. And we hand these one by one to the base calling model. And the job of that base calling model is to predict what were the bases in the pore at the time that that signal was measured. But we're not overly concerned about what any one read says in isolation about our sample, but rather what a group of reads says as an ensemble. And so for this reason, we usually have a downstream model or algorithm that takes those base called reads as input and tries to produce some kind of useful insight about our sample. Say, for example, how it differs from a known reference sequence if we're doing variant calling. We spent a lot of time and energy over the last couple of years improving our base calling models, and this has boosted our single read accuracy, which of course feeds through to secondary analysis performance. But what we haven't spoken about so much is really optimizing these models in the second panel. So that's what today's talk is all about. Before I go into any specifics, I should emphasize that most customers won't need to change anything to benefit from these improvements. And that's because the vast majority of secondary analyses that people are using out in the field today are already implemented as epitome workflow. So you simply select the analysis that you want at the beginning of the sequencing. All of the bioinformatic plumbing is done for you, and you can focus your energy on gathering data and analyzing results, which is a lot more fun than debugging bioinformatic pipelines. So you can see some of the most relevant workflows to this talk on this slide. There's plenty more on the website, or alternatively, go and speak to the epitome team who are based in the room just over there. OK, so with that out of the way, let's have a look at some of the tools under the hood of these workflows. And broadly, we can split secondary analysis into two main categories. We've got variant calling, where we have this trusted reference sequence, and we want to say, how does my sample differ from that reference? And on the other hand, we've got de novo assembly, where we don't have that reference sequence, and we instead need to construct it with the reads that we're getting from our sample. You can see on this slide some of the tools that we use in our workflows. Some of these are internally developed. Many are developed by external collaborators and from academia. So of course, we're very thankful to all these people. OK, so what are the latest developments? Well, let's focus first on variant calling. So this is a really typical secondary analysis task in that we have two models. We've got the single read base calling model and also a variant calling model. We've had improvements on the base calling side with the new V5 models, as well as a new motor enzyme. Both these things boost single read accuracy. And we've also found a better way of training our recommended variant cooler, Claire 3, which better balances how we train on SNPs and indels at training time. What this means is that we're now at about 99.8 to 99.9% .9 F1 score at very achievable read depths with both hack and soup. And, for, and that's for SNPs. And for indels, we're at about 99% for soup in coding regions, about 95% for hack, and we're a little bit lower outside of those coding regions. The main reason for this is because of the long homopolymers that we see outside of coding regions, but this is something that we're working on, and we've got a fix for now at the chemistry level through the new assembly polishing kit, which I'll talk about in a bit, as well as some new ideas for architectures that might better be able to bridge this gap. If you'd like to hear more about using nanopore data for human variant calling, there's a poster that I'd really recommend you go and check out. The title of this is on this slide. OK, so switching over to de novo assembly. And if you're at London Calling this year, you may have seen Sean's talk, where he showed that Oxford Nanopore data is all we need to achieve state-of-the-art automated human assembly. And this is possible thanks to a couple of new technologies. So the most important thing when we're doing human assembly is that we have very long, very accurate reads. And we're able to achieve this by combining our ultra-long read kit with Dorado Correct, which is our Dorado-based implementation of the Hero read error correction algorithm that Mike mentioned earlier. So this gives us those long, accurate reads that we need to assemble through the repetitive regions, such as centromeres in the human genome. 
And it means that using 45x of these reads, in addition to a 35x of pore C, which we use for phasing, we're able to get 30 human chromosomes assembled from end to end without gaps, and a further five scaffolded, which means that there are small gaps of known length. This comes out of the box at about Q40 accuracy. Again, the main source of error is those long homopolymers. And so to fix this, we're introducing the new assembly polishing kit, or 6B4. What this does is essentially a PCR amplification of our data, except for we incorporate mods um, into that PCR amplification. This has the effect of breaking up the long flat signals that we see associated with homopolymers and allows us to better resolve their length. So you can see that the assembly accuracy can go from Q40 to above Q50. We're making this available to customers at the moment in an early release program, so I'd recommend checking the website or speaking to a member of the team if you're interested in using this kind of analysis on your data. Okay, so that's the latest uh, developments, but I'm sure you're keen to hear about what's coming next. There's plenty of research going on across the teams, um, but I've only got so much time today. So I've decided to talk about some new neural network architectures that we've been having some early success with for consensus polishing. I want to emphasize that these are still in development, so we're not releasing them yet, but we think there's some really exciting results that we'd like to share with you. So we saw in Catherine's talk and in the T2T -T slide earlier that we spend a lot of time thinking about the accuracy of our assemblies. And for that reason, we often have this step which we call consensus polishing, whereby we get what we call a draft assembly from a tool like Verco, HiFiASM, or Fly. And we want to go through that assembly, find where any errors might have been introduced during the assembly process, and fix them. So we do this by aligning the reads that we use to make the draft assembly back to it, and then giving it to a model or an algorithm that tries to find those errors and correct them. And our recommended software for doing this is called Medaka, which puts a neural network in that blue box. You might be thinking, well, why do we need a fancy neural network to do this? Surely you just align the reads, and you choose the base that most reads thought to, um, was at that point in the assembly. Certainly, we can do majority voting, but what we find when we're doing sequencing is that not all reads are cr created equally. So you could imagine that different reads have different amounts of trustworthiness. Say, for example, if a read aligned to multiple points in our assembly or if it had more errors, we might want to downweight how important it is when we're making a prediction for what the base should be at that position in the assembly. So you can see the effect of adding a neural network to do this task. Of course, we could write complicated rules that capture how trustworthy the reads are. But actually, what's easier is just to go and learn it from the data using a small neural network. You can see the effect of this on the bar chart on the right-hand side. So in light green, we've got the read majority vote. So basically, choose the base that most reads thought aligned to that position. And in dark gray, you can see Medaka, which is a neural network. And there's a significant boost to the assembly accuracy at a range of different read depths. So now I've hopefully convinced you that neural networks are really helpful for consensus polishing. Let's have a look at how Medaka is working under the hood. And as I say, we start by aligning our reads to the draft assembly, and then we construct this object that we call the count encoding matrix. Each column of this matrix is specifying a point in the draft assembly, and each element tells us how many reads thought that that position was a specific base. So you can see in column two here, for 75% of the reads that aligned in the positive direction, predicted an A, 25% predicted G, and then for the bottom five rows, all of the reads that aligned in the negative direction uh, thought it was a G. So it's an A or a G, and the neural network has to decide that, and it outputs a predicted consensus. As you saw before, this works much better than majority voting, but there is still a problem. And to motivate this, I've given you a toy example here where you can see two reads. And they're exactly identical, except for read one predicts A in a specific location, and read two predicts T. And how do we know which one of these reads is more trustworthy? Well, looking at them like this, there's nothing to separate them. But we, of course, base calls are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all the data we have about a specific read. So we could look at, for example, the Q scores, which tells us how confident the base call was in its call for that position. And we might find that the Q score for the A call in read one is much higher than the Q score for the T in read two, so we prefer that. As I said, this is only really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to all the information we have describing specific reads. So we could also use, for example, the alignment direction, which we've seen is already encoded in our Medaka models. We could use the Q score. So we spoke about how we want reads that align well to the assembly, and we would trust them more. The Q score is a metric that describes that. And we can go even more fine-grained than this and add signal-specific features, such as the dwell time, which is the time between each transition of the motor. And you can see that in the signal here. 
So this is all given as output by the base caller. So all we need to do is adapt our consensus architectures, our consensus polishing architectures, to take all that additional information as input. And that's what we did. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the architecture. And as I said, this is still a prototype, so it may change. But the key difference here is that it gets access to all this additional information about each read. And we find that training even very early examples of this architecture, we get significant boosts in uh, consensus polishing accuracy. So here you can see our current Medaka models using hack-based calls in light blue and using soup-based calls in dark blue. And you can see the new architecture using hack-based calls, but it has access to all that additional information. And what that means is we get a significant boost to our assembly accuracy at a range of different read depths. It's also important to note that these features aren't specific to consensus polishing. So we also like to introduce these additional features into variant calling, and that's something we're planning on working on in the immediate future. As I said, this is only one thing that's going on in the research teams at the moment um, in secondary analysis. There's plenty of other things, and I've added some examples on this slide. Thank you very much for your time.